Starship is undoubtedly the brightest star on all stages now. However, if you're looking at Starship only, it'll be a grave miss because Falcon Heavy, SpaceX's three-headed monster, has also woken up and shouldn't be disregarded. How will SpaceX capability once again shock NASA during a flight? Let's find out everything in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Both SpaceX's Falcon Heavy and Starship could take to the skies next week in an action-packed few days for Elon Musk's space firm. I was even imagining that could happen the same day. It might seem implausible, but given SpaceX capability, it's not entirely impossible. And who knows, it could happen. <laughs> In fact, while Starship's schedule is still unclear, the Falcon Heavy mission set for April 18th from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida will launch a powerhouse bus-sized broadband satellite for Viasat into the high-altitude circular geostationary orbit. This demanding flight profile will require the disposal of all three of the rocket's reusable boosters. The company's sixth Falcon Heavy launch will send Viasat's new broadband satellite into geostationary orbit on a roughly six-hour mission, including multiple firings by the rocket's upper stage. The maneuvers will take place with Viasat's new six-ton internet satellite and a small rideshare communication satellite for the startup company Astronis, and that'll go to circular orbit roughly 35,000 kilometers over the equator. SpaceX technicians have assembled three Falcon Heavy booster stages together in a hangar just south of Launch Complex 39A. Ground crews have rolled the rocket the quarter-mile distance to the launch pad Wednesday in preparation for a test firing of the 27 Merlin main engines as soon as Thursday. That test firing will last nearly 10 seconds, with 27 engines briefly throttling up to generate about 5 million pounds of thrust. The hold down firing will occur with the Falcon Heavy's payload, which is completing pre-launch preparation at a separate SpaceX payload processing facility. After the test firing, SpaceX will move the payload fairing containing the Viasat-3, America's broadband satellite, and Astrani's Arcturus communication spacecraft over to the hangar. After the Falcon Heavy completes the test firing, SpaceX will lower the rocket horizontally and roll it back to the hangar for integration with a payload compartment. Early next week, teams will return the fully integrated launch vehicle to Pad 39A and raise it vertical for the final countdown. The launch window will open at 7.36 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time next Tuesday, April 18th, or shortly before sunset at the Florida spaceport. The Falcon Heavy rocket's two side boosters will fire at full power for two and a half minutes, then jettison to fall into the Atlantic Ocean a few hundred miles east of Cape Canaveral. The core stage will then throttle up to full power and burn for about a minute and a half longer, then separate for its own destructive plunge into the sea. The center core for the next Falcon Heavy launch is brand new, while the two side boosters are refurbished rockets flown on two Falcon Heavy missions in 2019. The weight of the Viasat-3 America's satellite, coupled with the high-altitude target orbit, will not leave enough leftover propellant in the boosters for landing maneuvers. The upper stage will ignite its single engine for the first of three planned burns, first to place the Viasat-3 America's and Arcturus satellite into a parking orbit, then to raise the apogee or high point of the orbit to an altitude of more than 20,000 miles. After coasting through space nearly six hours, the upper stage will reignite its engine a final time to circularize the orbit over the equator. Then the Viasat-3 Americas and Arcturus satellites will deploy from the Falcon Heavy rocket and wrap up the multi-hour launch sequence. SpaceX will use the Falcon Heavy excess lift capability to carry a rideshare satellite for Astronis. That's a San Francisco-based company that built its own spacecraft. The Arcturus spacecraft weighs about 300 kilos and will provide internet service to Alaska. Well, while Falcon Heavy launches may be familiar, this upcoming flight is certainly worth witnessing because it involves the rare challenging task of putting payloads directly into orbit near geostationary altitude. That's a feat no current rocket, not even NASA, has accomplished. It's generally difficult to place payloads directly into an orbit close to geostationary altitude, which is about 36,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. This is because geostationary orbit is a special type of orbit that requires very specific conditions in terms of altitude, inclination, and velocity. To place a payload directly into geostationary orbit, the rocket must be launched with a specific trajectory and velocity that would place the payload in the correct orbital altitude and inclination. This requires careful planning and precise calculation 
as even small errors in launch trajectory or velocity can cause the payload to miss the intended orbit. One of the challenges of placing a payload directly into geostationary orbit is the amount of fuel required to achieve the necessary velocity. The higher the altitude of the desired orbit, the greater the velocity required to achieve it. This means the rockets must carry more fuel, which can increase the weight of the rocket and reduce payload capacity. Falcon Heavy Profile requires extended battery life on the upper stage, plus a custom band of gray thermal paint on the rocket to help ensure the kerosene fuel doesn't freeze during the hours spent in the cold environment of space. Another challenge is the need for precise control of the rocket's trajectory during the launch and ascent phase. Any deviation from the planned trajectory can result in the payload missing its intended orbit or requiring additional fuel to correct trajectory. As a result of those challenges, it's more common for rockets to place payloads into a transfer orbit than take them to geostationary orbit. This transfer orbit requires less fuel than a direct ascent to geostationary orbit, but it still requires careful planning and precise calculation to ensure the payload reaches the correct altitude and inclination. In fact, the previous SpaceX missions with direct insertions into geostationary orbit carried satellites for the U.S. Space Force. Some details about those missions in November and January were classified, but the satellites were presumably lighter in weight than the payload on Falcon Heavy's launch next week. SpaceX was able to recover the Falcon Heavy side boosters on the two recent Space Force launches. Viaset has not said how much it paid SpaceX for the launch. Until SAT officials said last year, SpaceX charged a premium for a launch where the boosters expended. Viasat 3 Americas is the first of three new generation broadband satellites for Viasat, which beams internet signals for underserved consumers, businesses, and governments. Based out of Carlsbad, California, Viasat has agreements to provide in-flight Wi-Fi to passengers on Delta Airlines, American Airlines, United Airlines, Southwest Airlines, JetBlue, and some other commercial airlines. We designed, built, and delivered the most powerful satellite platform we've ever provided to a customer. The result is an engineering marvel, said Michelle Parker, Vice President of Space Mission Systems at Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. The satellite has some of the largest antenna reflectors ever sent to space and will rely on all electric propulsion for fine orbital maneuvers and station keeping. After separating from the Falcon Heavy rocket, the spacecraft will use its plasma thrusters to raise the orbit to a final 1,100 kilometers to geostationary orbit. That's where the velocity will match the rate of Earth's rotation. This would allow the Viasat-3 America's spacecraft to hover over the same geographic position along the equator at 88.9 degrees west longitude, providing coverage over North and South America and adjacent maritime regions. Viasat and Boeing are working on two more satellites to provide similar internet service over Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, as well as the Asia-Pacific region. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget, share your ideas in the comments section below. Your support motivates us to create more quality videos. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.